Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Guys, I'm in a rush, so I'm going to get this done really quickly. So without further ado, we're going to be talking this morning and today about boots on the ground rhetoric, more of it coming out of the United Kingdom. Guys, it seems to me that it is an inevitability now that boots will be on the ground in Ukraine at some point. If you've been following this channel for a while, I've been documenting the, um, what are they called, the temporal markers. I like that phrase now, guys, the temporal markers. Um, I've been giving you guys the temporal markers of things that need to happen before this happens. So we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about the situation on the ground in Syria and how that could bring, drag Israel into this um, into the conflict and a wider um, escalations in the Middle East. We're also going to touch on Georgia, what's happening on the ground in Georgia as we reach the sixth night of protests. The situation, and I found this out from you guys, one of you guys in the comments put... There's not actually anything to worry about in South Korea. This sort of stuff happens all the time. So from yesterday's video, I said I was going to, I was giving you what the mainstream was saying. I was giving commentary. I don't know if I'm going to add that into this these areas of conflict. So Ukraine, Georgia and Syria, I'm still putting in the same bracket, guys. But before we go on, as normal, I want to go to the shared map and show you guys what's been happening on the ground in Ukraine because they really don't have a front line anymore, guys. They really don't. It's absolutely wild. We are heading to a global conflict of an industrial scale. There isn't any way out of it now, guys. It doesn't matter who says what or what peace negotiations happen to who. I mean, look at this from the side of the Russians, for example. The Russians know that the Minsk, excuse me, the Russians know that the Minsk II peace agreement was never meant to last because I think it was the, was it the Germans or it was somebody anyway. I, I can picture her. I can't, I, I can picture her. I can't remember her name. You know, she came out and she's, you know, and, and, and people have said it now. People in authority in Europe, in, um, you know, as, as part of NATO, you know, these people have said what the, what happened during the Minsk II ceasefire. This was just a time to rearm and retrain Ukraine. So as we're moving forwards now, do we think Vladimir Putin's going to come to any peace negotiations? We'll come on to that afterwards, guys. But let's go straight to the share map now because I know your time is valuable. So I'm going to do two months now, guys. But what I want you to focus on is this town here of Pokrovs and this town here of Valle Novosilka. And what I want you to consider is this pincer movement. So the pincer movement, like a crab, is where you come from the north, from the south, or from the east, and from the west. doesn't really matter. But you encircle a town or a location or a fortified location. And once you've encircled it, because the, um, the defences are strong in the central position, once you've encircled it, you know, you give the guys inside, uh, you give them a way out and then you let them retreat. And then that's when you close the pincer. Also, you can close the pincer, but that gets dirty. Anyway, so we're doing two months now, guys. And what I want you to focus on, guys, is this town here, Valle, uh, Valleca Novosilka, I think, and Pokrovs. I'm going to have to ask my friend how to pronounce that. So I'm going to go forward to two months, guys, and watch the amount of ground that the Russians are taking. And I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think that there's a front line here? Also, with the amount of ground the Russians are taking, look at the amount of ground, which is zero, that the Ukrainians are taking back. Just fast forwarding, guys. Every click is a day. And look at the phenomenal amount of ground. Look at this bit here, guys. You know, they're coming north and then they're going to head uh, west. Look how fast that is moving. And there really is no media attention on this at the moment, because if there is media attention, people will understand that the front line is over. So this town here, guys, uh, Valleca uh, Novosilka, it's gone. It's finished. It's over. The guys need to retreat. They need to get out of there. You know, Pokrovsky. OK, um, I just thought there was two towns there named the same Puk Wow. Uh, it's Ukraine, guys. It's Ukraine. Strange things happen. But that's the situation on the ground, guys. So there really is no front line anymore. The front line's gone. It's over. It's finished. It's not coming back. What we're waiting for now before we get boots on the ground is the introduction of these landmines. So the anti-personnel landmines. Now, I'm just going to share a... I'm going to 
in fact i'll put these in the i'll put these in the description guys um an article this morning i believe uh, yes this morning i'll put these in the description britain considering sending troops to ukraine under a ceasefire deal I keep saying, you know, boots on the ground are an inevitability. This is how it works, guys, okay? The boots on the ground will go in as an international peacekeeping mission, peacekeeping force. It will all be part of a ceasefire. The ceasefire will be fine. Everybody will be happy initially until the boots are on the ground. They're bedded in. They're acclimatized. The logistical chains have been proven. And then guess what? The ceasefire will fail. There'll be more fighting on the front line. And again, this is just one possibility of boots on the ground. Um, how you how this gets dressed up doesn't really matter at this point because all roads are leading towards the same um, destination, which is a global conflict of an industrial scale. So the way we're looking at the moment is there could be some sort of, uh, again, could, could, could. And I'm going to come on to what why Putin, I don't think, will go for it. But if we go, if we pretend that there's going to be a ceasefire, remember, there'll never be a ceasefire. When I was out in Ukraine in 2016, there was a proposed ceasefire. The ceasefire was supposed to be holding. Guys, I was on the not as a I was on the front line as an observer and I can tell you with a hundred percent certainty that ceasefire never started it never it just continued there was continued bombardment so we could see a situation where there's a proposed ceasefire that never really happens in the west in the east and if we're not being told about it on the media how do we even know what's happening uh, we would then get a peacekeeping force in Ukraine. That peacekeeping force would then acclimatize, like I just said. And then once the boots are on the ground, it doesn't really matter what happens next. So there's, it's come out that, in fact, I will share this with you guys, because um, I will share a few of these things. Because there's no way, in my opinion, that Putin's going to fall for this peace deal. There's nothing on the ground. Um, you know, like we keep saying, there has to be a physical feature on the ground to make this peace deal work. Now, as far as, like, I'm concerned and Putin will be concerned, the only thing that he could have a peace deal behind is the River Dnipro. Putin, Ali, says Russia will likely reject Trump's... Trump's Ukraine deal. Of course he will. And remember, the only person who can decide on whether they come to peace negotiations at the moment is Vladimir Putin, because Vladimir Putin is on the front foot. Remember, he's taking ground every day. If you've, you know, from the map we just shared, he's the Russians are taking ground every day. So why are they going to come into a peace agreement when they would be, you know, they would be actually getting less out of that peace agreement? So no peace agreement. Vladimir Putin takes what he wants. Peace agreement, he has to come and flim flammer with agreements and let NATO troops into Ukraine. So you see, there isn't anything on the cards for, um, uh, for, for Russia there. So an article from um, yesterday, unlimited enemy troops, no sleep. Ukrainian soldiers fight to hold on to Russia's Kursk region. Now, again, guys, early on in the Kursk incursion, I did a video and I said, listen, you know, I think the Ukrainians, want, now they've pushed into Kursk, they need to evacuate really quickly and they need to just keep doing that, striking and seizing ground all over, all over the border. Holding ground becomes very costly. It becomes costly in manpower. It becomes costly in money it becomes costly in equipment it becomes costly in munitions obviously I, I gave that analysis i thought well do you know what i'm biased because i'm from that um uh light infantry background where you would go and strike a target and then get off you don't stay for tier medals that's you know that's somebody else's business um i've never worked with armor i've never worked with um artillery most of my military career has been you know in um in, in, in light clothing and light lightly armored vehicles in fact unarmored vehicles actually <clears throat> speed is cover guys um so the situation in kursk it looks like it could have been a double-edged sword for the ukrainians in the context that they've had to invest a lot of time a lot of the resources i said and those resources that they've pushed into the kursk region they could have actually been better spent holding off, uh, what is it, Valiek, uh, Sover, the, the two towns I said, Pokrovs and the other one that I cannot pronounce. 
And then if we switch over now, guys, to what's happening in with the situation in uh, in Syria, you've now got both Iranian militias, you've got Iraqi militias all heading over to Syria to assist in the to assist Assad fight off these rebels, whoever the rebels are, you know. Again, you know, there's there's lots of different like names, Al Qaeda, ISIS. I think ISIS K. To me, I'm not right. Who are these guys? They're probably all the same guys. They're just they just wear different t-shirts. You know, I don't for one second accept that there's like uh, these different uh, different command structures and different groups of people all with totally different ideologies. No, I'm going to say it's the same people just wearing different t-shirts. But what the reason I'm talking about this now is I feel. Like with the um, like with the situation in Ukraine, where you've got where you could have the potential of a NATO peacekeeping force moving into Ukraine under the guise of peacekeepers, and then guess what? Once those boots are on the ground, they're no longer peacekeepers; they're then offensive uh, offensive troops. What I feel could be happening right now is the investment of Iraqi, of Iranian troops into Syria. Obviously, Syria borders uh, the Golan Heights, and then the Golan Heights, you've got Israel. So what I see is a situation now where this manpower investment could be then turned on Israel. It, you know, that situation is just absolutely insane. And remember, you know, the, this it like that... Um, that region really is Russia's southern flank. And, it, uh, you know, there was an article out earlier saying it's crumbling fast. So the Russians have to prop up the Assad regime with their aircraft, with their military. Uh, and now you've got this huge military gathering in Syria. I, I would suspect that the Israelis are absolutely terrified about this happening. Now, what I'm going to share, I'm going to share an article now, guys. And this article, it's kind of, it's one of those articles where it's not what's telling that's telling, it's what they're not telling you that it's telling you something, if that makes sense. Pentagon confirms A-10 strikes in Syria claiming defence of US forces. So what we hear here, what we can see here is US forces still in Syria. Pentagon confirms A-10 used to defend them. Now, it's not common knowledge, although it is now, guys. This is out in the open. You know, if if they're defending U.S. forces, then it must mean that there's U.S. forces in Syria. That's not me saying it, guys. That's not me speculating. That's me reading off this stream. Now, what I would say is uh, the U.S. and the coalition forces that were operating in Syria. Can I get a map of Syria? Will this? Let me just, while I'm talking, guys, let me see if this can zoom out into Syria. No. Um, so the if you think of Syria, guys, you know, the northern border of Syria with Turkey, there's uh, that's called the northern corridor. You've got like from uh, you've got from Fishkabur, which is the uh, border crossing point on the river. Uh, I can't remember if it's the Euphrates or the Tigris. I never I can never remember which one's which. But basically all the way from that border crossing point to right, follow it all the way west. You come to another river uh, just west of a town called Kobani. That is the oil producing regions. Now, I would speculate that the U.S. military are in that region securing those oil fields. Where's that oil going? I don't know. Who's taking profit from that? I don't know. But that whole border with Turkey, you know, that is that's where I'd say the U.S. forces are. Um, what I would say also is predominantly U.S. special forces are and all special forces, actually. Um, one of the things they do really well is train local militias. I say so you've got Delta Force like um, U.S. Navy SEALs, the, the British uh, UKSF do it really well as well. Um, but if we have a Delta Force contingent out there, which I would say more than likely is or a Rangers Battalion, then these guys would be training local militias. They'd be tra training local militias in task specific um objectives so how to do x how to conduct x y and z now i'm not saying this has got anything to do with the um the incursions the attacks on aleppo the attacks on the syrian government but guys you know we have a situation in the middle east in syria that looks like it's going to drag more troops into that region and then those troops i feel could be pushed into 
Israel. If that happens, you know, we're just going to have to like bolt all these together as, um, you know, as another, as another, um, you know, as another, as another, either as another conflict or the same conflict, because I don't think we can, I want to keep the, the Middle East conflicts separate to what's happening in Europe because the United States, when they get involved in the Middle East, when the United States get involved with Iran, you know, this this whole thing, it's going to be very difficult, um, you know, to um, identify different rules and responsibilities. But for now, that's how we're going to keep it, guys. OK, so the Lebanon ceasefire is under strain after Israeli strikes and Hezbollah mortar fire. So this is an article from the BBC. So you can see, guys, none of these ceasefires are, you know, none of these ceasefires are holding. They never hold. They never, never hold. Because you've got commanders on the ground who fire something, then somebody else fires something. And as soon as one person fires something, like the ceasefire is over, it, means, it makes no sense. <clears throat> So Middle East crisis, this is from The Guardian. Um, Israel will not uh, differentiate between Lebanon and Hezbollah if the ceasefire... In fact, I need to share this, guys, because this one's an important one. Because it shows you what's coming next. It shows you the rhetoric. Remember what Donald Trump said. Um, if the hostages don't get released, they'll be held to pay. Middle East crisis. Israel will not differentiate between Lebanon and Hezbollah if ceasefire collapses. Defence Minister Katz says as it happened. So what they're saying there is, listen, you know, if the ceasefire doesn't hold, we're going to come in and level the whole place. Now... Historically, this is how the um, Israelis operate. Now, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm just telling you how they operate. Um, they go in there, they will do a rubbleized, they use this new tactic. It's called operating in a rubbleized um, zone or something. There's like papers out on it. I've read them, they're, they're, they're wild. Uh, where you go into an area, rather than take the building dynamically, invest in manpower, invest in troops, clearing the building room by room, you bring that building down, you destroy it with um, artillery, then you send in bulldozers. Guys, it's wild, it's destructive, but it's really effective. Um, you know, and that's how the um, that's how the Israelis are operating. The humanitarian crisis that this cause is unbelievable. The further enemies it causes is unbelievable. You have to, you, when you're fighting a conflict, you kind of have to do it. You kind of have to do it with one arm tied behind your back because you you strike this balance. First of all, you need to win the conflict. First of all, you need to win the conflict. Second of all, you don't want those people coming back at you in five, 10 years time when the children that are 10, 12 years old are now, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18. You know, you, that's what you don't want. So you have to fight two, com you know, you have to fight two com campaigns. You have to fight the tactical one and then the uh, psych psychological, the, you have to protect hearts and minds, guys. Okay. So you have to build bridges. You have to build schools. You have to do all the rest of that stuff. If you, again, that's, this is, you know, obviously if you ask an Israeli commander, he will say, no, we just flattened the whole thing. We're not bothered. Uh, but that's the way, I, you know, that's the way I look at it, because what you don't want is like, like I said, 10 years, 15 years, those kids who've witnessed this, you're just making more enemies. So remember what Donald Trump said from yesterday's video, they'll be held to pay if the hostages are not released. Guys, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say that these hostages will never be released because they have already been They've already, they're already, they've already been released, but not to this, not to this world, guys. It's tragic. I mean, my, I, I can only imagine, well, I can't even imagine what the families are going through. Um, it's just wild, guys. It's wild. I, I don't even want to think about it. You know, I've been, I've been in the military a long time. I've seen a lot of this stuff happening. I've seen a lot of these people uh, firsthand. And what we don't understand what, what people don't understand in the West is the human toll and the human suffering of these conflicts. People don't understand it. Um, something that's really poignant to me, I was in uh, I, I was in Mosul once it had been destroyed. And um, I was watching this girl. And I, I assume it was a girl and her brother. The girl was a little bit older. And they had, um, they had a bottle with um, like... It was like almost luminous um, green liquid in it. I don't know why it was. And that was their toy. You know, they was playing with that. And I mean, I had a daughter around the same age at the time. And, you know, it's really difficult when you see this and you see this human suffering. And, 
you know, and then you, you see these politicians who've got no idea. They have zero, zero idea. For them, it's, they're just getting told, as you know, as Dominic Cummings says, they're just getting told what to say. They're reading off a script and they don't know what's happening. I'd like to take some of these politicians, you know, right out to the front line and show them what's happening and say, listen, guys, you know, this needs to stop, right? We really need to stop. If you guys want to make money, we need to go and put a colony on, on uh, we need to go and put a colony on the moon. We need to go to Mars. We need to start asteroid mining and all that sort of stuff. We'll bring you guys until riches. We don't need to drop these things on each other anymore. It's insane. Um, David Lammy's put his foot in it again with a tweet um, over unacceptable humanitarian situation in Gaza. So remember, you see these diversions where the United States is going to focus in the Middle East. I've talked about that on enough times, guys, you know, because they're the only ones with the... Um, with the logistics to have a to invade Iran, basically. And now you've got all these troops. It, guys, it, you've got... you. Like this time last year, you had lines in the sand being drawn. Now the lines in the sand have been drawn and you're seeing people stand behind them. So you're seeing the amount of troops gathering in um, Syria, which is not a good thing for the Israelis because the Israelis are not stupid. You know, they're going to be looking at this and thinking, right, OK, so we've got a load of troops. We've got a load of Iranian troops now in Syria. Yes. Huh. And now we've got a load of Iraqi troops in Syria. Yes. And they're not our friends, are they? No. Huh, right. I mean, what do we think is going to happen there? Um, but you can see these diversions now, guys, where the United Kingdom is going to have to push towards leading in Europe and the United States will lead the fight in the um, in the Middle East. So let me come on to this article now, guys, which is a quick update from Georgia, because all these things, they really are connected. Uh, we need new life. Protesters uh, undeterred in battle on the streets for Georgia's future. As protests on the streets of Tbilisi entered their sixth day, demonstrators fighting for closer ties with Europe are building barricades out of wheelie bins and taunting police from behind them. Guys, I would speculate now, right now on the streets, I would say, this is me speculating, there are agents of the West trying to inflame this protest there may be special forces guys ex-special forces guys it doesn't really matter you know this happened you know and don't forget there'll be russians out there on the streets as well reporting on this situation so what i see happening is and again you know as soon as and if and i hope it doesn't happen but as soon as the georgians start to use lead as a deterrent then you're going to see the, you know, then you're going to see this erupt into a an armed, is it an armed conflict? An armed uprising, an armed conflict. This literally echoes what happened in, uh, in Ukraine in 2013 to 2014. If you, and, and this is echoing as well what could happen in the United Kingdom. So for the Georgians, they've been under Russian, um, I'm not going to, I don't want to use the word Russian oppression, but a heavily, lean, a heavily Russian leaning government since um, 2008, 2009. So that's what, 15 years. Can you imagine 15 years of like Keir Starmer's labour? How would the people feel? And then when there's a little spark, Everybody's out on the streets and they know because the Georgians know right now if they don't push this through, they're all doing serious jail time. Those cells are getting closed down. People are bad things are going to happen to people, you know, who've been instigating this people who've been putting their necks above the water. So that's what that's what happens. And that's what and we're seeing this brewing in the United Kingdom at the moment. We're seeing these um you know, they, like I always give the, you know, we, we've seen this big, this simmering pan and all that the government have done at the moment is put a heavy lid on it. And when these things go, it happens catast uh, catastrophically. So that's the situation in Georgia, guys. You know, I'm I, I'm just conscious this video is getting on, guys. I'll put all these links in the description. But the the update from this via, uh, from this vehicle, the update from this video, guys. The, there's more rhetoric out this morning about boots on the ground in Ukraine. Um, that Britain and um, Britain and France may send boots on the ground as part of some ceasefire deal. 
again, guys, I've given you my opinions on that. I don't want to go over it. Um, the regions in Ukraine are falling. The Kurus region could be a double-edged weapon. We have got Iraqi and uh, Iranian militias now reinforcing the Assad regime, which basically means fighters are turning up in Syria. Syria, obviously, that could they could then be used to launch into Israel. The situation in Georgia is absolutely wild. It's getting worse and worse every day. Guys, the world is not safe at the moment. The world's not normal. These things are not normal. I can't remember a time when things like this were ever happening in such, um, such large quantities. Anyway, guys, I'm going to max a grid. I'll get you guys another video later.